Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson with the Mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, John Cruikshank. We're here at Trump National Golf Club for the Mayor's monthly update. Thank you for being here. No, of course, how are you Liz? I'm doing great. great. And of course, when I say here at Trump, every month you have a Mayor's Breakfast. Um, you rotate between here and Terranea and uh, this morning you met with committee commission chairs, the city manager, uh, Councilwoman Ferraro is here to kind of go over. There's so much happening right now in the city, specifically with the landslide. Yeah. Um, how did that, but how did your breakfast go? Well, like you mentioned, every month as mayor, I have an opportunity to hear from all the people that are the leaders or the, the chair people of the different committees and, and planning commission, of course. And the meeting went well. I think that, of course, the focus has been, as it's been for the last year, about the landslide, and everyone wants to hear about that. And I think that affects all the committees and the planning commission. It's been over a year now since we've declared the state of emergency emergency in the landslide complex through the accelerated movement. And the good news is we're hearing it slowing down. Um, with all that, can you just kind of give us an overview of where we're at, especially as still hundreds of our city residents that are impacted are still without power, without gas. So with that, just give us an overview of what's going on right now. And today it's October 25th. For those watching, we're filming on October 25th. Things change by the minute. Well, uh, today things are better than they were last time we met. And the reason they're better is because um, of the efforts of our public works department and uh, our city geologists and the resources that they have. And, and people need to realize that our city has been dedicated to slowing the rate of movement down in the landslide area. As we were doing testing, we found we couldn't use the hydro augers, which was a system of draining the water that we had talked about for many years. And we found the second slip plane, which was, you know, obviously another 150 mm -hmm. or so feet below the first slip plane. And we realized we couldn't use the hydro augers, so we started using these vertical wells, and the first wells went in in September. And we thought that they were going to be shearing off within a couple weeks. As of today, I believe we have seven or eight wells that are at, down at the Beach Club area. None of them have sheared off yet. The amount of water is uh, right around 1,000 gallons per minute that they're drawing out wow, of there. it's picking up. And, right, and because we're doing the monitoring of many different points within the landslide area of how much they're moving, some of those areas are not moving at all anymore. We were seeing movement of 13 inches a week, record movement, and it's down now to even like one inch or less than two inches I'm reading, according to the city geologist is mapping and figuring this out. And because of that even, there's been some exciting news of the hundreds of homes that have been without power that maybe uh, SoCal Edison as of today was working on re-energizing some of the homes. What are you hearing about that? I, I think as we sit here today, we, we have to realize that some of these residents up to there's 250 or so residents that don't have power, and they haven't had power for almost two months. Think about that. And so after we've gotten our results of this deep water wells that we've been pulling all this water out and the amount of the way we've been able to decelerate the landslide movement, we wrote letters uh, on Friday of last week asking Southern California Gas and Edison to turn the power and gas back on. And um, although they're initial reaction was to those letters was that we need to see a little more proof that it has slowed down to um, and it's going to be sustained but they have told us that they are going to be turning on power uh, to well they say 16 homes yeah I will say that since this goes out to all our residents I think it's important to note that when Edison went out to look at those homes that they were about to re-energize that they found that because of the emergency power that each resident had to get for their own homes some rewiring's been done, mm -hmm. the change to the metering and that, and so Edison can't just rehook things back up. They have to kind of bring things back. So anyone watching this today realize that we're trying to get the power restored to every single home, but it might not be instantaneous because now they have to kind of reverse engineer what's been done at, at a home to get the power which is being created by generators and other means. There's a lot of things happening and a lot of effort to bring funding and assistance. Yes. Um, individual assistance for the um, the residents impacted. That's been going on with a grant from Janice Hahn's office right now. Yes, and as many people know, our city is trying to turn over every stone there is. And as of this recording today, only the county office has provided any type of funding. Mm -hmm. uh, Janice Hahn uh, secured $5 million for us. Much of that money, $2.8 million on her behalf was given as a direct aid to the residents. So um, those are coming in a form of a grant. Right. And basically the residents that, all the residents that are in the affected area have an opportunity to get 
$10,000. Yes, I know that we've had um, over at Ladera Linda, they had um, opportunities where residents came and met with our finance team. And of the amount of money allocated, I was reading that we've had, there's been 180 application, applications received and our city's already distributed about $1.4 million from that grant money. You know, a lot of people were concerned that it once again gets caught up in this bureaucratic mess, but our city's really tried to remove that type of red tape. And so, like you said, our finance department is meeting directly with people, just getting the required information, which I don't think is a lot in terms of the bills and other things that they've had to expend for the this problem we've had and so people are getting checks. I mean we hear always you know, this is a bigger project than for our city to handle and like you're saying our staff the council is going turning you know no stones going uncovered trying to get with the state and federal um, agencies FEMA to bring to get money our way. Yes. Um, the council did approve for the re uh, for the mitigation measures um, extra dollars on October 1st meeting uh, 6.1 million to continue the emergency response. I mean, uh, our budget for our city is what 30 plus million. 38 million a year right now. During that meeting, we actually uh, believe that the expenditures that we've authorized will be about 40, 43 million dollars. So, our city is pretty much going through all of the reserves we have, what we call a rainy day fund, mm -hmm. which is for an entire city of 42,000 people. Now, we realize that the landslide area is the area that's affected, and, and fortunately, we don't have other calamities like this going on. So, um, but yes, our, our city has expended a lot of money, will be expending a lot of money. We're getting ready for the winter, right. of course, and we're officially in rainy season right now. And according to our city manager, they're talking about another atmospheric river type conditions during this uh, rainy season, which could start as early in December. So our city has been busy uh, getting us ready for that as well. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to push on the state and federal government for resources. Y you know, as we always talk about, we need to be prepared and lining the canyons, making sure that the 80% of the runoff that ends up going right into the ground doesn't go right into the ground. So we're getting ready for that. So a lot of work's been going on up in the landslide area right now. Um, both the Abalone Cove and Klondike Canyon landslide abatement districts have been busy winterizing their areas as well. And we can never take our eyes off the ball ever again. Even when it's not a rainy season, we know that that water is underneath the ground there is what causes the problem. So we need to be pumping forever, essentially. The community is really coming together uh, too to support. We've seen um, an outpouring with the Portuguese Banner Relief Fund that was set up by the Rotary Club. Um, they have a, you can go to the website for the Rotary Club and you can donate to the fund. Um, also, Mend the Bend um, was created um, also with the help of the Rotary and a nonprofit called Communities Child, helping to um, bring relief and support to people um, impacted. So talk about all the way our community is trying to help and a lot of this, uh, these efforts are taking place at Ladera Linda Community Center. Well, let's start with Ladera Linda. Um, yeah. That community center, this is the exact reason you have a community center is when people are in need and they, they have others to talk and, and learn from and, and basically you know, make each other feel better about the current situation. And we have these amazing groups like the Rotary Club. And now, like you said, they've developed this community's child group. And every Wednesday, they've been having these Mend the Bend dinners. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like there's a lot of healing going on in terms of being able to talk about what one another are doing to either keep the power on at their house or whatever other assistance they can give each other. And I know that's so important for our community and um, we really thank the people that are volunteers that come out and, and, and care about all of our residents. Right. Yeah, this is part of the interesting thing is we try to help our residents. We find so many roadblocks in our way. Um, you know, with, our, with like Southern California Edison, they claim that they want to be helping us uh, with off-grid technology, but they then they say that the, the CPUC doesn't allow them to do that. I don't know, I mean, it, it feels like they should be trying harder to being able to provide alternate power for our residents. Mm -hmm. They haven't done that. That's been very disappointing. And, and that's not right. I mean, I, I know what's happened back in, in Florida and in North Carolina is tragic. People have lost their lives. And so don't want to minimize that. That was a much bigger calamity. But they worked very quickly, FEMA and others, to restore power uh, very quickly. I think up to a half a billion dollars was the federal government put in to restore power. And we have residents that have still don't have power after two months. Right. 
Well, we appreciate that you keep at it and working with all the different agencies. Um, and as we wrap up talking about the landslide, because we have a lot of other business going on in the city right now, anything you want to add to the community, just where we're at one year after the state of emergency and just sort of um, are being hopeful that we're, we're we've, the, hopefully the worst is over. And I think that's a, a, an excellent word. I mean, I, I think we've always been hopeful, but I think we've also been diligent in understanding what the big problems are. Number one, the movement of the landslide. It was just too much and untenable for the utility companies. And, and as we know, it's just been a mess for them. We thank our Cal Water Service for yeah. maintaining the water because if the water was turned off, then that basically condemns all those homes. Mm -hmm. Slowing down the rate of movement, we're, we're doing that. We found the key to doing that. Now, of course, it's gonna start raining again and that's gonna aggravate the problem. So we need to continue to do the deep water wells and we need to winterize and make sure the water doesn't just soak right into the ground. We need to get power back to, to our residents and we need to keep fighting for that. We know that part of that is to slow the landslide movement down. We've seen that we're doing that. Edison's come back and said we need to see a little more sustained time to show that it's working long term before they reinvest, turn things back on and it just goes back. I kind of understand that, but in the meantime then we should have had other ways to get people off grid in their homes and that's the part that has been. So we're, we are working with some companies in terms of maybe a, a potential city finance way to get some off grid power mm -hmm. to those residents and maybe that's what we need to do so we don't have to right. worry about land movement in the future right now money we're relying on generators which really isn't sustainable no it's the least time. efficient most environmentally right. unfriendly way to be able to maintain power okay all right well we're going to obviously be talking about this uh, for many many months to come uh, we're going to move on to talk about another big topic and a big project for our city and that is the civic center master planning process um, give us an update it was before the council um, and on october 15th you approved the update and also a project manager um, that so just bring us up to speed on the planning and also the federal requ this federal requirements that are needing to be fulfilled under deadline right well as people might not know that the land is actually owned by the federal government and we're leasing that land and that's how it's always been. So we did uh, authorize to bring in a project manager and that project manager would help us to make this four-year deadline that apparently we have with both the GSA and FEMA okay. to be able to prove and show that we are using a good part of that land for emergency operations because that's a contingency for the, the lease. The threat is is that if we can't show that we're doing that, that they might take the land back. So, you know, here we are dealing with this huge issue with the landslide trying to get FEMA's help. And then the other hand, they're saying they want to take our city hall away from us because we're not using it enough for emergency operations. Right. So um, this is one of those things we talk about in terms of government and left hand, right hand, not knowing what, what they're doing. So yeah, we've brought in a project manager. I think there's other tasks for that project manager. You know, we, we've talked about, okay, so we've kind of slowed down the future new Civic Center, but we still have 100 people that work for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, and they are working in a barracks that was not made to be a city hall. And so those upgrades, we need to upgrade city hall consistently to make sure that they're in a, a good environment it's hard to recruit people out here. And so mm -hmm. when people show up at a old war barracks, it doesn't actually show itself. It's on the most beautiful piece of property in the world in one of the oldest, dumpiest city halls in the world. So we've got to keep things going for our city staff and our residents to come and do business there too. So that's why we brought on a project manager. And then I won't be on the council next year, but the, the goal is, is that the next council continues their hard work and working with the Civic Center Advisory Committee right. to keep the project moving forward because ultimately we need a new Civic Center. Yes, we do indeed. Um, talking about moving forward, the council on October 15th um, was trying to, was, did take some action to um, try to improve our cell phone coverage here on the hill we here in our city. We all know that there's quite a bit of areas you're traveling and you can't get service and it's not only frustrating, but it's unsafe, like if you can't even call out. So tell us what the council's action was. You heard from wireless carriers, concerned residents, first responders at that meeting to talk about ways that we can improve our wireless telecommunications in our city. So we know that we have several different cell, cellular carriers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. 
And it doesn't really matter which one of those you have. Nobody has great coverage on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. As many know that uh, aesthetics are important to our city and mm -hmm. we've gone for years kind of pushing back on many of the ugly cell towers that have been proposed throughout our city. And I think that the cell cellular companies came back and said, well, you've imposed a lot of rules on us and restrictions and so we haven't put in new cell towers. But if you want it to work, we need to put in tall towers. Right, macro you know, towers. 30, 40, 50 feet tall. So maybe there's some opportunities to find locations to do that. We've, uh, I think where we're at with it now is it feels like there's at least discussion going on. We went for several years not even really talking to them. And, and we've just, the cell service has gotten worse and worse. We are talking to them now. All the cell carriers have given us their recommendations. And I think it's gonna be up to future planning commissions and city councils to find a better balance. And like you mentioned, there's certainly huge uh, risk in terms of health and for safety. You're on your street, someone's approaching you, you try to get your cell phone out to call the sheriff or someone and, and you have no bars and you can't. So that's a huge safety concern and we need to address that. And we had several people come and testify, doctors and mm -hmm. others testify of situations where this happened where people are having actual medical incidents and they can't get a hold of someone to come and, and provide the service they need. So. We need to definitely look, relook at some of the aesthetics that we've pushed back on. And it does look like the cell companies have actually done a good job. If you kind of remember back in the day, they used to have the big boxes sitting right. on the ground and all this uh, wires and equipment. And, and if you look at what was presented during the city council meeting, it was a lot more elegant. Like the, the street light, you could see the canister on the top. Yes. And, and then even below, they could put uh, antennas and it's, it's all concealed pretty well. So I think they've done a good job. So I think we need to find a good balance we definitely need better cellular service on the peninsula and, and, and not, not just because it's inconvenient, but because of safety and security. Right, and the takeaways from that meeting after hearing sort of from all sides of it, I mean, I'm hearing one of the carriers say that RPV has 70% coverage. That's a lot of areas without coverage. That's a lot of areas. And, um, but again, I think that it seemed like it was going in the right direction to get back, to, to get back at the, bring everyone back to the table, exactly. all of the stakeholders, and let's see if we can grow that number. Well, that's right. I mean, if we're not talking about it, then we're not going to fix it. And right. so there was a good dialogue and we appreciate the cell companies being there. Mm -hmm. And hey, I mean, they're the ones running the businesses. Uh, I always talk about this, that government imposes things on businesses. And they never ask businesses how it affects them. I think they gave us some real true reasons to why we have bad right. cell coverage. Yeah sort of talking about public safety aspect of wireless um, services brings us to the next question, which is just, you know, public safety is the number one goal of the council, um, even though we're obviously focused on the landslide situation. Um, but with public safety, um, in terms of resources being spent, time, there's a lot happening to st get our community um, to take action to help prepare themselves for any kind of emergency. Over 17th, our city staff participated in the great shakeout drill. RPVT was there and uh, recording all that just to show that our own staff was prepared. Good. We know, we know, you know the rule. When Did you guys have to drop? Drop, and cover and hold cover on. And hold, yeah. But also during that, a lot of the staff was asked, who has the uh, MyShake app? Do you, I don't know if you have that I on do. your phone. Because preparing for an emergency when the emergency happens isn't being prepared. So we never think so. Takeaways are have a go bag ready. Um, you know, in your car and be prepared and uh, like on those things and have a plan. Um, and we have the Prepared Peninsula Expo, which RPV TV, we go in there and cover. Our city participates October 27th. That expo, um, but that's actually this weekend. So by the time this is running, we will have been there covering it, but we'll okay. show all those great tools from our emergency first responders. And then um, also we have um, just to uh, tribute, pay tribute to our first responders is also uh, National First Responders Day is October 28th. We can't ever say enough to all of our, the people that are out there risking their lives to help keep yeah, us safe. Absolutely. And then we also have another way to keep our community safe with our city's public safety reimbursement program. Do you wanna give a plug to that? Sure, how that works? so I believe that uh, homeowners associations can get these safety cameras installed and they get up to $2,000 for each neighborhood. And then individuals for your home, you can get uh, also the uh, cameras for safety and security, mm -hmm. and I think it's $100 for individuals. Yep. Um, and I think that's a city website thing. Yep, and we can plug our city website, rpvca.gov, and to go in there for all that information and to find out everything going on. Um, 
We have a few more minutes left. A couple more council, um, city council action that took place. A cat and dog ordinance. Um, and uh, to increase the number of cats and dogs allowed on a residential property. Um, talk about what, what the, why this came up at the council and what, what took place. Well, the reason it took place is because um, really the LA County is the one that handle most of our, our services with uh, any type of animals or wildlife. Um, they currently allow four dogs and five cats. We only had three dogs and three cats. I don't know how someone can handle three cats, but now someone could actually have five cats in, right. their, in their home. So we've upped both the dog and cat quantity. Dogs um, three to four, cats three to five. Yeah. Yes. So if you want two more cats, I don't you have any pets right go now. Go out and so. get two more cats this weekend. And I think when, with the council <laughs> action, like bringing the code up to match the county's code, um, also they're thinking maybe to this will encourage more uh, pet adoptions. We have like San Pedro Pet Pals. Our city partners up with these agencies too to help sure. make sure we're taking good care of our I mean, animals domestic are animals. cute and fun. Mm -hmm. uh, if, but mm -hmm. if you want to travel though, it's kind of hard. Yeah, and if you need any animal services, you can call um, the DACC, which is the Department of Animal uh, Care and Control Office. And they want us to plug the number 310-523-9566. So if you have any issues regarding animal services, you can call that number. We're at the end of the show where we talk about things you've been up to for the month of um, the last month and uh, during October and any final announcements. So I know you had the Cal City's annual uh, convention that just took place in Long Beach. Can you give us an update on that? And I know there was an important resolution that there the was. council was supporting at that conference. Yeah, so Cal City's had an annual conference in Long Beach uh, and all the cities from throughout California were there represented. I think in terms of seminars and learning opportunity, I think it's it's great for city staff, city managers, uh, other high level people in, in city to, to learn about the latest and greatest and learn from what other cities are doing. I think there's a lot of good lessons learned. There's a lot of great camaraderie. I think that any city that's gonna be successful can't just work within its city boundaries. It has to have the resources. And there's a lot of cities that are up and down California that are very similar to ours, not just a place like Malibu where it's on the coast and high fire mm -hmm. zone, but cities that are up in Northern California as well that deal with many of the same issues that we do. So that's important. And then there was a resolution that the city of Glendora brought forward, basically saying that any legislation that Sacramento passes that they impose upon any local governments that they have to be under those same uh, obligations and rules. Mm -hmm. One of those is, uh, you know, basically the the looking at the Brown Act, where you can't have a majority of council members talking about an issue uh, before or without it being a public hearing. Mm -hmm. That's not legal. But that's not true in Sacramento. Like. Uh, a majority of, of lawmakers can talk behind closed doors about an issue, decide on an issue, and vote on an issue uh, in public after they've talked about it in private, where we as local officials, we are not allowed to do that. So we believe that this was a, a good type of resolution. The resolution actually passed, but there wasn't a f enough of a quorum. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that it ends up going to the, the board of the Cal cities and they, they decide on, on to approve it. And then what happens there is they have to take it to someone, either a, a state senator or a state uh, assembly member, so that they can have that bill introduced and passed. So that's okay. how that kind of works. So there's some steps to go to, right. to get that done. Some other things that we did, we honored a uh, longtime community leader, Dave Tomlin. Dave was on the planning commission with me for, for many years. And then uh, he recently was on the traffic safety committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is now retired from that. We gave him the city tile. And it was great to see Dave out there. And yeah. we thank him for all his service. And he was also on the school board at one point in time, right? So he's been very That's active. Right. He's always been part of our community. And it's what our community is about just volunteering and, and trying to work together and make a difference. Um, the other thing is you also, speaking of getting together with uh, local leaders, you had the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce had their legislative leadership get together. You were there and I know they talked a lot about the landslide. Uh, you know, it's we talk about the landslide and our city council talks about the landslide and then when we get all the peninsula together and the businesses and we had Senator Allen and Assemblymember Marasucci there, Pretty much that's what all they talked about as well, mm -hmm. the, the landslide. So everyone wants things done. And it's nice to see our state representatives focus on that. We appreciate that. You know, they have a lot of challenges getting the governor down there. They talked about 
that they believe the governor should be down here taking of a look. Course. Everyone else has actually been here, except, except for, the for the governor. And he I declared guess, the state of emergency, but that's just one step of it. The big part is coming yeah, here. I mean, it's just one. Yeah, I mean, the bigger step is is that the state of California needs to not say it's a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. That's that's the roadblock right now. They're saying that what's happened is a pre-existing condition, and because of that, you're not going to get any state or federal funding, and that's what stopped FEMA and others from, from helping us financially. Um, we need the governor to change that rule, and we almost had that. Actually, Senator Allen had a bill, uh, SB 1462, that was pulled at the last second before the legislature left uh, for their break. So mm -hmm. that was unfortunate, and we do need the governor down here for that. Right. And I know as we're wrapping up the show and you hear about a roadblock like that, it made me think of what we didn't mention at the beginning of the show is before we wrap up is the whole, the bumpy road and what's <laughs> going on with PV Drive South. We're working on that, right? I know people always wonder, is this ever going to get closed down This at this point? It's, we're, no. we're keeping it going. No, it's yeah. not. We're, we're going to keep Palos Verdes Drive South open. Uh, it's a major thoroughfare. If that closes down, it condemns right. all those many more homes than what we already know. Mm -hmm. But I will say, though, that we've heard from our maintenance crews that because of the work we're doing with the wells, that the amount of uh, repair work that they've had to do has slowed down. They're actually doing less work because the road isn't getting destroyed as fast as it was. I know we jumped at the end, but I, I, I was an oversight. I should have mentioned Everyone that loves talking about the ski I know. jump. Come on. I know. And you know what? It brings us back to here. We're going to wrap it up because, of course, that's how we get right here to Trump National is huh. on PB right. Drive South between here and Terrane is so critical for these businesses. That road stays strong, not just for the residents, but for businesses like this. And we're so appreciative that we were able to come here. Um, and on that note, too, as we wrap it up, there is the election November yes. 6th. And when the show is running, um, whether you're seeing it before or after, we always want to make sure everyone gets out there and vote. Yes. And there'll be two uh, council member seats being vacated because of term limits. We're going to have to say goodbye to our mayor um, at the end goodbye, of the year. Everyone. And our mayor pro tem, Eric Alegria. But we've got great candidates in the mix. So um, just remember to get out there and vote. It's a great message. I know a lot of people feel like, why vote? But it makes a huge difference, certainly in the local level. Um, I wish it would more so in the state and federal mm -hmm. level, but it's very important. School board, city councils, our propositions and all, they're very important. It's been an honor being on the city council and the, the trust that people have had in me. My colleague, Eric Alegria, he, he, he's been a tremendous council member. Mm -hmm. There'll be two new people, and those two new people will step right in and represent the city just like we did. So. We're still working on what committee we can get the mayor to, to volunteer for. Is there, the a, fun, council, is there a fun committee? <laughs> we need that. Just call it fun committee. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Mayor Cruikshank, for all you're doing. Again, thanks to the Trump team for letting us here. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. Everyone have a great day out there and get out and vote. <laughs>